that's what what it means for me. And in order to do so, we need to promote universal jurisdiction instead of uh, downsizing, downsizing it, as it's been done in Spain. And it's quite a paradox that now where we all see globalization going every way, but they said that justice needs to be national, that it was good is that the justice is limited to within your borders and everything else is supposed to be free and moving free, freely around the world. Uh, let me explain why justice globalization is an urgent matter from a political point of view and from the political costs that it entails. And I'm referring now to the law reform. Right now in our country, and we see that in other European countries as well, we see how there are different, vindicate, uh, different claims uh, for democracy. Uh, our citizens request democracy. This is something obvious, but uh, still there is this basic structure for democracy, which is, of course, a very complicated uh, structure of uh, freedoms, institutions and rights, but it's based on the right to vote and also the rule of law. We all need to be equal in the face of <coughs> law. We need to have a balance of power, <coughs> powers. We need to have independent justice. And at the same time, we need to have freedom of press. I don't want to be pessimistic, but uh, again, I'm a journalist, I've always worked in journalism, and I can guarantee that the media are not working as they should right now, which adds up to the deterioration of this low-intensity democracy we have in Spain. So this weak and brittle structure that is uh, democracy right now finds itself uh, in a place where citizens are claiming a deepening of democracy, which is based on three key concepts, transparency, accountability and citizens' participation. Uh, this is a way to explain how we are fighting in order to to have a change in the rules of the game, uh, of the play. We want democracy to be deeper, to be more participation-based. But still, those who have the power, those in power, are trying to change the, the rules of the game as well. They are trying to change in, in, in a way that they are going towards evolution so it is not based on conspiracy, it is not based on paranoia, but there are some decisions that have been made in recent years after the reform of the 135 article of the Constitution to change debt into a priority. The payment of debt has become an absolute priority, which means that even if we've got 30% of juvenile poverty, as it is the case in our country, even more important than taking care of those people, people who are suffering poverty, kids who are living in poverty before that, even more important than that, it is to pay out debt. This is the way to deteriorate democracy. And we have other examples in memory, but I will not dwell on that. For the last years, I think we all feel that uh, democracy has been downsized and which uh, in turn means some losses for us, but there are also some gains and the thing is that we are getting organized, organized to demand democracy t not to stay as it was before the beginning of the crisis, but beyond that to, dip, to make it even deeper, to deepen democracy. Aximo Plume calls it the extraction elites, and somehow they tried to change these, uh, these rules, these standards, but the other way around. This is about Spain. As for Europe, I think it is clear as well that there is a tension, a stress, or a fight between paradigms and trying to change the rules somehow, to change the game. We've seen that there have been some exceptions tools, such as the META, the, the uh, rescue mechanisms from, or the Troika, which is alien to EU law. And there, there have been different laws drafted that are alien to EU original law. 
trying to make those tools somehow to stay away from the parliamentary or democratic control and so away from citizens' control. And this will have some implications, for example, for the next parliament that will be elected well tomorrow in some countries, European countries, and we see many more xenophobic and populistic parties elected, well, all in all, anti-European, anti-EU parties, which are actually opposing this room, this uh, room for freedom that took us so many years to build in Europe. At a world level, I think that we are clearly seeing how the game's been redefined for international relations. We might refer to Syria, where a tyrant such as Assad is slaughtering his own people. Yesterday, the day before yesterday, we see that the number of dead people is over 160,000 deceased people. But uh, today, we saw how in China and Russia they were trying to redefine international relations. And one of the key elements that they highlighted, and I think it is pertinent to this topic and the discussion, would be that it is accepted that the state matters belong to the states. So this is just a radically opposing uh, universal jurisdiction. They say human rights are not to all up to all of us, but are just a national <coughs> matter, and the state will interpret how they want to enforce them. I mentioned <coughs> Russia, where they joined uh, Crimea just recently, which is a violation of international law, and there's been no entity, nobody that could claim lodge a claim according to international law and that is that this is a breach of international law we have the UN we have the this, uh, Security Council but unfortunately that council is not made up of judges interpreting international law I mean unbiased judges but it is made up of countries countries which by the way have their own interests their own alliances that prevail over any kind of alliance or, or respect for law which is very important, by the way, because all experts know, and there are many experts here in the room, and they know that law needs to be enforced at a national level. If we had the law, if we had the judges, but we didn't have fines, or we didn't have prison sentences, people would not abide by the law. It is obvious, yes, but it needs to be recalled, but because at an international level we don't have anything of the kind. We could have the uh, Security Council, but it is not operational because each country is trying to defend its own national interests instead of international le legitimacy. This addition of tensions uh, somehow lays out the, the, the field for the main um, political discussion, in my opinion. And together with the topic of inequality, which has become more and more relevant, not just from a social point of view, but also from the point of view of go governance or, or a political viewpoint. And what I mean is the international discussion for the last, for, for the upcoming 25 years would be a battle or a struggle between democracy and tyranny. On the one hand, we would have democratic countries that are not invested in the fight for democracy. And I like that, that, like that you said that democracy needs to know that is ethically superior uh, against tyranny. I'm sure of that, but sometimes democratic governments uh, don't behave as if they were certain of their superiority, maybe because they have some kind of complex or uncertainty, uh, maybe maybe uh, they don't see themselves as we would like them to be. But I think that that struggle between democracy and tyranny is going to take place, but uh, has to <coughs> fight anything that is downsizing uh, democracy and uh, downsizing universal uh, crippling universal justice and jurisdiction is a way of uh, damaging our democracy. We in Europe should be willing to give away, but uh, EU policy is non-existent or at least not pertinent. And so we cannot trust that in the short term. I hope that in the mid-long term it will be possible, but in the short term in Europe there will be no promotion of universal jurisdiction at all. In such environment and amidst a, an international crisis, a debt crisis. What's happened in Spain? Well, 
the thing is, our country, our government thought that, thought that the way, best way out of the crisis would be not to disturb China. I've said China. Why? Because China is buying our debt, it's buying um, state in, in Spain, and this is not just a supposition. Um, we had the Secretary of Foreign Affairs at, at, at the House of Commons, and again, I convey the uh, upset, the, the, the feeling of my group, and, and I ask about how our relations have improved with China after the reform, uh, play, pay, taking into account their needs. And his reply was, no, 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 this was not warded in Pekin, or Beijing, sorry, as you say, I was just being ironical. Um, it was done at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and not at the Ministry of Justice, by the way, and I quote here, the relationship with China follows its natural course. These weeks we have investments from China in Spanish debt and also <coughs> the state uh, bonds are being bought. So business as usual, that was the summary. We've solved that pitfall that it's a universal jurisdiction and so we can still count on China buying state and buying debt and so they will help us rebuild our country. Well, this is the first political cost of our reform, and that is that after Sp Spanish diplomats, because this friction happened, because when China was told at first that they could not have an impact on uh, the, the national the Spanish criminal court, especially uh, genocide in, in Tibet, and they said, well, uh, <coughs> tribunals in Spain are independent, so I think it's a good time to explain to this kind of government how democracy works. In a democracy, courts are independent and no matter how much you pressure, they will keep doing the same. So we had an opportunity to, to do that, we didn't use it, and we said whether the cost is political or not. So we are telling them that as part of this debate on, on principles, Spain, Spanish <coughs> government has taken its part. So in this struggle between tyranny and democracy, the Spanish government has taken its side and instead of advocating the independence of uh, courts and instead of being avant-garde for uh, the universal jurisdiction, we said that we would pass our laws according to the needs of uh, China. And so what we've conveyed to the Chinese government is that when our democracy is upsetting to you, we will adjust it. When law and justice will suffocate you, we will come in and oxygenate you. So in that basic discussion of principles where the question was the dilemma for the upcoming years is whether we will make it possible for China to look like democracies as the ones we have in Europe or maybe the other way around and China will make European democracies look like a ch um, tyrannous as it's the case I think that Spain's taken sides and they've decided that doesn't matter um, anything about judge independence or trials and court independences and they are willing to adjust to the demands of the Chinese government <coughs> where we all know they have systematic violation of human rights but there is a second conclusion that it's also damaging. We've shown them the way to change laws in Spain. In Spain there's no need to run for election, there's no need to be an MP, there's no need to be elected by citizens. The only thing you need is to have the power to threaten a government and say that you are not buying any more debt. And so they draft your laws as we want. This is a clear perversion of democracy because citizens in their own will never have the power uh, to do so. The power will lie in the hands of other governments, countries and even financial groups that might not belong to any country, a specific country, but we will, citizens, we will never have the power uh, that our vote was supposed to give us. Unfortunately, and I can uh, guarantee, because I'm uh, updated about the uh, House of Commons, everything that's been done for the last two years is a way, is paving the way to uh, foreign countries in, in and Spanish countries out overseas. I think it is only natural that it is part of a policy in, in a government, but cannot be the only thing. And when you're trying to balance out something that is so important, not just for our 
country, but for humankind, and I mean universal jurisdiction, we need to wait up and we, uh, we need principles to re prevail over uh, financial interests for years, over the case, probably we'll have to pay <coughs> the price for having a show at an international level that we are willing to adjust our laws to pass them to the demands of tyrannies. And in international relationships, we see that a good reputation, a good name, well, it takes time to build that good name, but you lose it much more promptly, much more fast, uh, uh, much faster. And so we could have played a role as a country that has no open conflict with any other countries, a country which in the past <coughs> had had quite a role in development cooperation. And still now we are sided with those countries that had fallen into moral misery, as you said, falling into moral misery. Or one of those countries that have a price, come at a price, and, and we have a price tag, and <coughs> whoever is willing to pay, we are there. Another implication, political implication, even more, all the more visible, it is that it's been uh, damaging for the parliament. This was not put forward by the government. The government did not make any announcement or initiatives to try to to uh, repeal this universal jurisdiction. They just just the parliamentary group trying to to also alter the difference that should be between the executive and the judiciary powers. And so they were just, this group was just as a servant. Well, we were not shocked, of course, because that's the way uh, they, they work here uh, in, in Spain. But at the same time, the popular group was avoiding something that should be in all drafts, and that it's um, reports from the uh, ancillary powers, uh, prosecutor office and all kinds of offices that are a control mechanism or a tool, they got rid of them, weakening even more our parliament and our democracy. And then there was <coughs> one hearing and it was urgently pros processed in order to avoid the discussion from happening, uh, avoiding the, the debate, which is necessary. Because if it's not discussed, if it's not part of the debate, then citizens cannot have an informed decision. They cannot make choices or calls about the representatives or, or police makers. Uh, this debate was not allowed because since it was um, processed as an urgent matter, they only used uh, two plenary sessions. It was just as a fast track system with just some partial amendments to each article and that was it. A society without debate, without discussion, and a society where uh, discussion is precluded from, from happening is uh, a society where there is no democracy. A final remark, and this has to do with uh, justice. Well, it also has a high cost when it comes to expectations. Because I think it is obvious for all of us that when human rights violations go unpunished, it, it promotes other violations uh, happen, the, 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 the new violations. So this measure promotes impunity, makes the world worse, a worse place and Pol Pot or Hitler would be happy and comfortable in this kind of country and Anna Frank or Primo Leve would, Leve would feel unprotected. This universal jurisdiction is adjusted to the new world that they want to build, to the new game they're trying to uh, abide by. More tribe and not so much citizenship, many more tyrants and not so much democracy. This is the new paradigm that um, some want to put forward. And in the light of this, I think many of us here, we want to change the game, that's true, but in order to achieve a greater democracy in other countries, in the European Union, and also at an international level. And amongst all those expectations, we hope to have citizens' rights, freedoms, safety and security. So we want to have citizenship as a whole, again, against tyrannies and trying not to look like those tyrants. For the last two months, in our struggle for a new game in Europe and the world, we need to understand how justice in Spain has become a long list of claims. Thank you very much for being here, for trying to boost this democratic change, for adding up to the discussion that was stolen from us. 
when it was the time. And thank you for refusing this involution and that it's the repeal of universal justice in Spain. Thank you very much. For Irene, Irene Lozano, and I quote, you mentioned two conflicts, Syria and Ukraine, <coughs> where several governments, especially the US, are supporting terrorists. As a journalist, probably you have first-hand knowledge. How do you think we can turn you universal jurisdiction into a tool that is not used by others. Oh. As for Syria, that you asked, well, I think if we were to have a near trial in, in what, when war is over, the government and the high commanders should be prosecuted <laughs> together with the terrorists that are clearly committing abuses and uh, violations of human rights. I mentioned Syria because I wanted to expressly refer to what the president of the US explained, uh, having crossed a, a red line, and that it's the breach of international conventions against nuclear weapons. And uh, back then, Obama, a uh, nuclear chemical, sorry, and so he thought that he was legitimized by the international community to take uh, retaliation actions, military actions, because he didn't, he didn't do it because he didn't have support, because there was a parliament vote in the UK, um, they lost. And when, when Obama decided not to do so, he loses his power as a deterring power. I don't think the US needs to be the, the police force of the world, in the world, but I said it, <laughs> someone needs to make sure that international law is enforced everywhere. So the question was, how, does, how can we make sure that universal jurisdiction does not become an interfering tool in the matters of sovereign states? Well, I think we need to go beyond this idea of interference. Uh, Home affairs, interference, those are the, the, the terms always used by dictators. The, the, the terms uh, when, uh, when death penalty has been uh, criticized. I think this concept of sovereignty is uh, somehow cracking. Cracking has been cracking ever since Pinochet's case. And then there have been different events, subsequent events. What I think, what I've tried to explain is that we cannot have a Security Council which is having decisions made by countries that have their own interests, their own alliances, their own friends and foes in traditional terms. And in order to have enforcement of international law, we need unbiased interpreters of international law when there is a violation against uh, chemical weapons or um, some unlawful acts such as the adhesion of Crimea, Crimea well, there, this institution needs to take the following measures because there's been a breach of uh, this number of international laws. The same uh, is it done at a national level if we have uh, someone killing someone out in the street and the judges uh, passes a ruling. I think this idea of interference has also been covered and, and needs to be left aside. We need to be careful, of course, because what I say here is uh, controversial. I know that because these are anchored in our concept of international law. But, of course, we need to find a balance. We need to be very careful. Uh, I know that. But there was this prevailing idea of interference in a private home, which just to be quite a hindrance against the fight against uh, domestic violence. Uh, what happened within a household was to be supposed private. It was difficult to raise awareness in society and explain that when there is a crime, when there's an abuse, when it's domestic violence of any kind, it, it affects us all. It concerns us all. That's the essence of universal justice. When there is a 
Violation of human rights in Syria is not an interference that we're trying to curve it, to put an end to it. It affects us, they are crimes against humanity because they affect whole humankind, not just Syrian people. And those crimes in Pinochet's uh, Chile, it affects us all. This was the principle of universal uh, justice that helps us arrest Pinochet. So we need to review the concept of interference and we need to have international institutions that can enforce international law uh, on an equal basis and on an unbiased basis, uh, uh, regardless of geopolitical interests. But I think this concept of uh, interference and sovereignty somehow have been overwhelmed by the facts. It's not that I try to repeal them, but they've been repealed by facts.